Hello and welcome to our exam BNP Paribas 23rd uh, CEO conference and today's presentation with Standard Chartered. Uh, during the call, uh, all participants will be in listen-only mode for the duration uh, of the meeting. However, we encourage you to uh, all contribute by submitting a questions via the question box on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, which we will then turn to following on from my uh, introductory questions. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Bill Winters, uh, who is CEO of Standard Chartered. Uh, and perhaps, uh, firstly, if I, if I could start by um, asking you to talk about latest operating trends in some of your key markets, uh, such as Hong Kong, mm -hmm. Singapore, and China, which, which clearly performed very well in the first quarter. And also, perhaps you could talk about what impact lockdown restrictions are currently having in, in Hong Kong. We read, we read about um, the low vaccination take-up, but I wonder if there's any implications there uh, as, as the economy unlocks on, on your own performance. Thank you. Uh, great. Well, first, Guy, thanks very much for having me. A pleasure to be here. Uh, we uh, obviously started the, the year, and I would say finished the, the end of last year with, uh, with, with very clear signs of strength, uh, in particular in those economies that, were, uh, that, that had recovered well or, or contained the pandemic. So most, <coughs> excuse me, most notably China uh, and, uh, and, and the rest of Asia. Uh, obviously, things have, have continued to evolve in the first quarter. I would say H Hong Kong uh, has continued to contain the pandemic uh, quite well, and is, is it's well under control right now. Although your point on on vac vaccine, uh, relatively slow vaccine rollout is is correct, but nevertheless the the, the case count is extremely low in Hong Kong. Mobility, uh, on the other hand, is remains uh, almost non-existent. It's very hard to get into Hong Kong, and and uh, that's a bit of an inconvenience for me, uh, but uh, a much bigger issue for the economy because of the the uh, the, the historic dependence on on visitors from mainland China. Uh, who, for the most part, are, are unable or unwilling to come into Hong Kong. Uh, but despite that, uh, we've had a good uh, economic recovery in the first part of the year in Hong Kong. Uh, I think that 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 triple uh, adverse uh, set of events, with first the the, the riots, uh, second the obviously COVID, uh, and then third the uh, the national security law, which just raised a lot of anxiety uh, in in the semi-autonomous region, uh, was. Um, uh, it seems to have been left behind. So the, the underlying uh, economy is getting traction. Retail sales are beginning to pick up. Property prices are quite strong. And, uh, and there's a, I think there's a, generally a, a much more positive sense in Hong Kong. Uh, as, we, as we move around the, the, the globe, but for us, as you get into uh, to, uh, Singapore and the rest of ASEAN, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the effects of uh, stepped up uh, restrictions or, or, or semi-lockdown or outright lockdown in, in, in some markets uh, like parts of India and, uh, and Malaysia are, are clearly having an effect. So the, uh, the, what was a, a, a budding uh, increase in, in consumer spending and consumer confidence uh, has, been, uh, has been held back. Not in, in, in any sense uh, that, that we have that it's structural or, uh, or, uh, or particularly severe. Even in India, where the, where the health uh, effects have been absolutely dramatic and uh, quite devastating, in fact, um, the economy is, is, is carrying on. P people are finding a way to carry on with their lives, I would say, but for a, uh, a, a period of, of uh, three or four weeks where things were particularly acute. Uh, we think the worst is behind us in India. Unfortunately and tragically, uh, the, the worst in terms of, of deaths probably isn't because of the, the lag effect, but the new infection rates are, are coming down quite substantially on the back of of uh, mobility restrictions and, uh, and increasingly on the, on the back of, of, of an approved vaccine picture. Uh, but in, in terms of, of our operation, we know we had a, a, an extremely strong start to the year, uh, in particular in financial markets and, and wealth management. We know that, that those are seasonal businesses uh, in most cases, in any case, and the MQ1 is typically the strongest quarter. I mean, we and I think everybody else called that out quite clearly in our, uh, in our, uh, in our Q1 earnings announcements. Uh, as we come into the second quarter, some of the underlying uh, underlying trends, I would say, have gone from being extremely supportive to just good, neutral. Uh, so uh, market volatility has reduced for sure. The uh, the, the the outright strength in uh, in risky asset markets in uh, in Q1 has gone to something that's more stable. Uh, so we would expect normal seasonal patterns to uh, to play out with uh, with a, a tapering down in Q2, but the underlying trends uh, that we see in terms of the, the things that, that drive our business through the cycle uh, or even through the year, uh, which are, you know, are we increasing the number of clients uh, that we have on, our, on the affluent side? Yes, uh, continued very strong customer increase with associated uh, AUM. Uh, are we seeing uh, a, a return to something closer to normal in terms of global trade with associated uh, cross-border payment flows and, and, and obviously trade financing? Yes, we are. 
uh, are we uh, seeing a, a, a the kind of confidence that manifests itself in 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 capex, cross border structured financing, structured trade finance, uh, sustainable finance, all these things, both the pipeline and the actual, uh, look strong and look like they're continue, continuing to grow. So uh, we're, we're as comfortable as we have been with the, the outlook for our business in terms of our ability to generate this 5 to 7% top line growth. Obviously, having flagged that the, the first half of this year will be quite a bit weaker for the very simple reason that we've got the base effect on, on interest rates. Normalizing for that, to the extent that you can, <clears throat> we grew 6% on the top line uh, in, in Q1, X the interest rate impact, uh, and continue to think that that 5 to 7% is, is the right range for us uh, for the year and beyond. Okay, very, very helpful. Thank you. Can, can we turn to inflation? Because it's, it's certainly getting a lot of uh, airtime in the press at the moment. We had some uh, interesting prints in, in China for PPI and then the, the US more recently. So I just wondered, you know, how are you positioned for potential inflationary pressures, what that might mean for interest rates, but then obviously on the counter to that, perhaps some cost pressures, uh, credit impairments, for instance. So how do you think about the, the trade-off there? Yeah, I mean, th this is, uh, I think, both in Standard Chartered Bank and probably everywhere, in every one of your shops, uh, probably the most uh, actively discussed uh, underlying trend. Uh, of course, the same day that you saw these these elevated uh, PPI and CPI prints, you saw 10-year notes, uh, you know, go from, 164 basis points to 145 basis points. Uh, so that, I mean, that, that, there's a bit of a disconnect between the, the increasing inflation concerns and, if, and in fact, the increasing inflation break-evens in, in, in markets like TIPS and the, the actual performance in the market. Uh, and I would say it's an active debate within Standard Chartered. How are we positioned? Well, we have a, uh, a, a relatively short duration of our, uh, of our assets in our treasury portfolio. Treasury portfolio is, is very large. Uh, we took some gains in, in the first quarter of this year. Uh, we've guided that, that those gains are unlikely to be repeated. Uh, obviously, you know, we, we got value in the portfolio, but we're unlikely to have additional material realizations in, in, the, in the very near term. Uh, so you can say, yeah, great, we're, we're relatively short duration uh, in an environment where, yes, there has been a bit of a rally in the past few days. Uh, but if you're really concerned about inflation, then, then we're, we're well positioned for that. At the same time, we said that we're going to sweat our treasury balance sheet in fact, our, our balance sheet more broadly, but in particular, our treasury balance sheet, we're going to sweat it uh, much more actively, including uh, the possibility of extending duration of, of assets and, and increasing our structural hedge. Uh, as we recognize and, and, and are, are further analyzing the stickiness of our, of our deposit franchise, and in fact, as we're increasing that deposit franchise uh, just by, by volume. So how are we positioned? I'd say neutrally. Uh, if we have an increase in rates and a steeper yield curve, that's going to be a good thing for us. And if it doesn't have the material economic impact, of course, if it does, then, then there's a there's a, a different question around around economic growth and the vibrancy of, of some of our markets. But uh, yeah, I, I'd say we're, we're, we're neutral to positively positioned. Uh, we're not particularly concerned about inflation in the short term. Uh, we, we, we buy the Fed line. Uh, it's hard for me personally to imagine that we come out the back end of this whole exercise without a period of, of, uh, of super normal inflation. Uh, but uh, but even that is, is heavily contested in the market, and I don't pretend to have a better view or a more informed view than, than anyone else. Uh, but uh, oh, yeah, clearly, a return to uh, to normal interest rates is going to be a very good thing for Standard Chartered and, and many other banks. Yeah, I think we we paid a probably a somewhat disproportionate price on the downside for all the reasons that we explained at the full year and, and Q1, and we would expect to, uh, to to have a meaningful recovery if we had a, a return to normalization. But we're not expecting that in the next couple of years. Okay, very clear. And, and turning to other property income and, and wealth in particular, it's obviously been a, a very strong engine of growth in, in recent quarters and Q1 in particular. I just wonder how do you assess the outlook here, given that sort of continued good quarters, but at the same, you know, and, and a very helpful demographic. But at the same time, we hear a lot about competition, a lot of people investing in this market. So how do you think about the outlook as a consequence of those factors? Yeah, I, I feel as good about it as I ever have. You know, we, we've been growing at, at high single digits, low double digits in our, our wealth management income. Uh, for the better part of a decade. Uh, we've stepped up our investment in that area, both in terms of, of, of customer service and, and, uh, and the client outreach and in terms of products and, and clearly in terms of, of digitization. The, all those things are paying off. So uh, the, we know that the wealth income, in, in particular that market sensitive uh, component of wealth income, which is you know, uh, uh, between half and two thirds of, of our portfolio, uh, we, we know that that's, that, that that's quite seasonal and, and also very, uh, vulnerable to, to swings in market sentiment. But the growth has been very consistent for us from year to year to year, uh, if not from quarter to quarter. 
Q1 super strong, Q2 probably a little bit less strong, but the, the underlying uh, growth in number of customers, uh, the AUM that they're bringing is very good. Uh, it's not a coincidence that we've been able to hold our own. We've invested pretty heavily, in particular in customer service. Uh, so uh, both preventing uh, errors or mistakes in the first place, uh, but also, and, uh, and maybe most importantly, in responding very quickly to anything that comes up. So, you know, I've, one of the measures that we use, I think they're commonly used in the market, are these third-party net promoter score surveys, uh, where for our, our affluent uh, client population, we've gone from being reasonably poor five or six years ago to uh, number one in six of our top nine markets and top tier in all of our top nine markets. And that's you know, the, the best indicator that the investments that we're making uh, are uh, are resonating with with clients, so they're they're happy to use us. They're using us more and more. They're also happy to recommend us to their friends uh, and to their family. So now, when when I joined Center Charter six years ago, uh, the most well, I got a lot of questions about the problems that we had. But uh, but in terms of the the, the way forward, uh, the, exactly the question guy that you asked, and hey guy, hey, it's, this is it's become super competitive. You know, why can uh, Standard Charter Bank hold its own? Well, it was super competitive uh, 10 years ago. It was super competitive five years ago, and it's super competitive today. And we've just done better and better and better because it's been an area of focus for us. So am I concerned about the next wave of competition? Yeah, of course I am, because you always have to worry. Our competitors are, are good, they're clever, and they're becoming more focused. <clears throat> but we're extremely well positioned to take advantage of what, what is fundamentally a super attractive uh, market opportunity, and which we've done very well on uh, in, in the past several years. On financial markets, so you, you sort of talked about it a bit in your some of your opening uh, comments, but perhaps you could expand. Um, so, uh, you know, you talked to a slight normalization in terms of activity, but equally it's been a good sort of underlying growth area, one, one might say. So how do you think about that looking forward? You know, are you confident you can still deliver year over year growth against what are some quite tough benchmarks? Yeah, the, the Q2 was the was the high watermark last year. It was, it was an extraordinary quarter. Obviously, it was the, the quarter when the pandemic uh, kicked in, and, and there was a massive interest rate adjustment and all that. So that that year over year, obviously, would be very very hard to sustain at a at a at a growth rate quarter to quarter. Uh, the uh, but from year to year to year, can we continue to grow this business? Absolutely. And uh, you know, we, we, I would say our, our business was underperforming four years ago. Uh, it has steadily improved since then. I, I don't know whether we're on market or ahead of market or a little bit behind yet, but the, the, the opportunity for us comes from, from these very key positions of strength that we have. You know, very strong position in local markets across our emerging markets. The most important of those is China, uh, where, where I think by any measure, the, the leading international bank in cross-border dealings uh, in China and hold our own vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese banks as well. Uh, and that's that, that's come on the back of, of you know, a long period of success, substantial investment, very good profitability, you know, excellent research, uh, a clear commitment to the opening up of China, and all the complementary services around the financial markets element of, of RMB dealing. So you know, we're the leading uh, leading bank in, in Bond Connect, which is the mechanism through which many of your clients uh, and many people on this call are investing in China into the fixed income markets. Uh, you know, we're the only bank that's got it now well established local custody business, local funds custody business on the ground. Uh, you know, we're we're the, the, the leading bank in, in SIPS, which is the, the, the SWIFT of, of China, the cross-border payment system. Uh, leading international bank, number four overall, uh, ahead of a couple of the big Chinese banks. So you know, this, 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 is, this is all about standard charter positioning itself. And by the way, when I say China, it's China and Hong Kong, right? It, it's, it's, it's one market. Uh, we run them as one market. The, the, the value that we get comes disproportionately from the flows of capital into and out of mainland China from Hong Kong. Uh, and, uh, and I think we've, we've, we've had that one right for some time. And uh, that, that opportunity will only grow as China continues to open up, which it is. Uh, it, it, it most certainly is. So yeah, that, that FN business, local markets focused for sure. Uh, I think we've, we, we were historically very, very FX heavy in our financial markets business. We built out a really good rates trading capability. I'll say just in time because you know last year and I think for the next couple of years, rates uh, will present as many opportunities or more as FX given the volatility that we're seeing in rates. Uh, we've had a very indifferent credit trading business. Uh, we both revamped the business for you know, good, good and growing profitability, but we're also much more actively managing our own balance sheet uh, so that we've got a much less buy and hold <clears throat> you know, static uh, credit positions on our portfolio increasingly liquefying that portfolio, which also means trading more actively, dealing in securitized products, structured credit products, and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, so that, 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 in addition to the revamping of our credit business, 
is uh, is putting us in, in, in uh, having another meaningful leg of that financial markets portfolio. And finally, commodities. So we're not the biggest player in the commodity business, but we've got a very good business uh, that has been very accretive, uh, sort of year in and year out, and it's growing nicely. So in each of these areas, uh, as we continue to transform our bank, continue to, to focus on, on delivering our corporate clients full range of, of the capabilities of our bank, together with the, the improvements that we've made in the underlying products and services, I think our, our FM business has a long, a long uh, period of growth ahead of itself, recognizing, as we always have to caveat, it's going to be bumpy from quarter to quarter. And, and turning then to, um, to costs, I mean, some of the regions you operate in typically have higher wage inflation than, than certainly some Western markets. And, and as we talked to you before, at a global level, there are some, some inflationary pressures potentially coming through. So do you see a risk uh, to be able to contain costs below revenue growth? Uh, and if so, what sort of incremental actions can you take on the cost side to, to offset those pressures? Yeah, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's always, it's always a challenge. I'm, I'm happy to say that we've met that challenge uh, certainly every year since I've been in the bank. Uh, I think the cost discipline is very well instilled. Uh, you know, we managed to absorb all of the inflation, all of the wage inflation, uh, and absorb a significant increase in our investment budget while keeping expenses flat for five years, essentially flat for five years. Uh, we don't intend to keep our expenses flat forever. Uh, we said that we'll keep our expenses below inflation uh, or at or below inflation, which, which should be a significant, uh, leave a significant positive jaw gap to the five to seven percent income growth uh, that we're talking about. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, initially, there was fat that we could cut, uh, but we also began our uh, our investment program in earnest. Uh, a, a lot of the initial investment program was defensive, so it was investments in financial crime compliance and, and things of that nature. There's still a meaningful defensive component. It's, it's shifted away from, from compliance now much more to cyber and, and data protection for all the obvious reasons. Uh, lower magnitude, certainly, than the, than the compliance investments that we made, but nevertheless meaningful. Uh, but we've shifted more and more of our uh, of our investments sequentially you know, from year to year into you know, hardcore productivity opportunities. So digitizing everything from end to end, for example, uh, creating a, a single core banking system, which we're, we've now rolled out in the first uh, handful of markets. We'll have, it, have this rolled out across most of our markets uh, by the end of next year. And then for some of the, the more difficult ones, like Hong Kong, which is on a completely different core banking system today, it'll take a while longer. But you know, we've got a very deliberate program to, to standardize the core infrastructure across the bank. Uh, we made big investments in, in, in removing our obsolescence across our systems. You're never done on that because new stuff is always becoming obsolete. But if you look at the stability uh, statistics for our underlying systems, there's been a dramatic improvement. It's like a sort of a 90% improvement in the stability and the, the uptime of our systems. And we're now at a place where I would say we're good, you know, having been in a place where we were bad. Uh, this is all, all, all by way of, of saying, where are the cost opportunities? Is to is to complete the drive uh, on the productivity side to continue to uh, to create a more efficient environment, generating savings at every turn, and then taking those savings and applying them back into uh, to increasingly revenue focused opportunities. Whether that's new digital banks or uh, you know digital asset custody businesses or uh, or improved customer service or you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and bottom line, uh, we think that's a, that's a well ingrained mindset in the bank now, and and one that, that we continue to expect to to improve even further. Thanks. I wanted to, to move on to to capital, which is uh, I guess an increasingly hot topic as we all await an update from the Bank of England, and hopefully in the next few weeks, so around whether you might be able to restart distributions post H1. Um, I mean, clearly you've got a very sort of healthy capital position. You're above your target range, but but not enormously so, if if you like. So I just wondered, how do you think about the trade-off between um, giving capital back to shareholders, clearly with the current share price, buybacks must be quite appealing, but then equally funding the growth in the balance sheet alongside some regulatory RWA headwinds coming through. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 think, I think we've reflected on the, on the RWA headwinds that we think that that's very manageable for us. We have, we have a, different, a different portfolio than, um, than uh, some of the others that I think will be harder hit, you know, particularly European banks or, or uh, possibly UK and domestic banks, perhaps. But, uh, in any case, that, that, that we think is manageable, but, but you're right, the, 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 the bias is on headwinds rather than the other way around. The, uh, uh, you know, the, the very good news from our perspective, and I would, I would have to think it's shared by the, by the PRA, Bank of England, uh, is that we went through a pretty nasty stress environment uh, without uh, ever having our common equity tier one ratio go into, our, go into our range. We stayed above or at the top end of our range throughout. 
Uh, and uh, I don't think we're unique in terms of having had a, a, a sort of a good, a good crisis from a capital perspective. Uh, but it certainly uh, goes to, to uh, helping the Bank of England believe that the, the industry that they regulate, and you know, let's just start focus on standard charter, uh, is, in, is in pretty good shape. So we're, we're hopeful uh, that we'll get the, the incremental allowance to, uh, to return capital, whether it's by, by dividend or, or buyback. Uh, it, we're also improving in our profitability. And uh, obviously, as the profitability improves from what was a low level last year uh, through to a, a normalized and then, and then growing level, We'll be continuing to accumulate capital, and uh, you know, we, we have had RWA growth, uh, but our, our growth has been driven substantially uh, by less capital-intensive uh, parts of our business line. So we will be creating a fair amount of capital that can be reinvested into our business. As I mentioned before, we've got a pretty full investment program today. Right? We, we have not left a lot of our highly desirable investment projects on the cutting room floor because of some sort of constraint. Uh, it's not to say you couldn't you, know, you couldn't spend another dollar because of course we could. But we feel like we're investing at about the level that we should be. But the question is: is uh, will, will there be things that are that are more important or more attractive strategically, uh, that are incremental to our current investment spend that we should be investing in rather than returning money to shareholders? And as as we said it at uh, in February and then in in uh, it was April, uh, we will have a very keen eye to the alternative uses of capital, not least the uh, return to shareholders via buyback, uh, with incremental capital that, that's available. Now, you, you'll ask at some point, no doubt, about the Citibank portfolio. And there are some interesting assets in there. And uh, we, and I'm sure a lot of other people, uh, are looking at them. We'll look at them. Uh, if the price is right, and, and the price needs to be right in the context of, that I just mentioned, which is you know, what the alternative use of capital is. If the price is right, uh, then th there could be something that we could do. Uh, and, uh, and if the price is not right, we don't need to. I mean, we, we don't need to buy uh, further business in India. We've got a good business in India today. It's improving dramatically. You know, we don't need to buy another business in Thailand. Uh, well, in fact, we sold our business in Thailand, but in, in, in Taiwan. Uh, the, uh, but but there would be interesting opportunities for, for an ad uh, if the if the price was right and the terms and conditions were right. And obviously, if, as, as we review those assets, uh, if it looks like uh, if the, the fit is as good as it appears they might be uh, from what you can see from the outside. Um, but we're sitting here with a, a, a share price at uh, you know, below five pounds. And uh, and we recognize that there's there's other uses of our capital that our shareholders might prefer. Thanks. Uh, last question from me before um, opening up to the audience submitted questions. I just wanted to turn to to ESG. Um, I mean, given your geographic footprint, the, the business mix, um, you know, one could say Sunshine is particularly exposed to, to climate change and, and managing that transition risk for the businesses which bank with you. Um, so I'm just keen to understand you know, what you view as the key competitive strengths for Standard Charter to mitigate this risk and really ultimately turn it into an opportunity. Yeah, well, I, I think you're right, Guy. It's, it's one of the bigger risks uh, for a bank like ours. It's also one of the bigger opportunities. Uh, the risk is obvious. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, many of the markets where we operate, so start with Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, big chunks of South Asia, uh, parts of ASEAN, uh, don't have the financial resources to protect against a, you know, a two or much less a three percent increase in, in temperatures, uh, in terms of uh, flood defenses. Uh, you, know, you look at the number of coastal cities in Africa uh, that uh, more than a million people uh, that would be severely impacted by that kind of of, of temperature increase. Uh, the inability to to survive in in important parts of India or sub-Saharan Africa from a temperature perspective. Um, so so the risk to our portfolio and our clients is real. Uh, from climate change, uh, and we've all seen that that could materialize in uh, sooner rather than later. Even though the, the worst of the effects would would, would most certainly come later. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the 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 flip side of that is opportunity. Uh, our uh, within our markets, we have some of the biggest uh, emitters in the world, and the biggest financing gap between uh, what they have available to them and uh, and what they'll need to affect their own versions of a net zero transition. Uh, so we've been we've been very upfront on this. Uh, we've been you know, quite vocal, uh, publicly and privately, for four years now, about uh, both the risks and the opportunities. Uh, we've got clear guidance on in terms of what we'll do with uh, with uh, companies that are reliant on coal, and and we've set aside significant amounts of capital to help those companies transition away from um, coal and and then other fossil fuels uh, into renewable sources of of power and the like. Uh, the indications that we have so far are that our clients are absolutely intent on making that transition themselves, uh, not because uh, we told them to, although I think that probably helps on the margin, but because they realize they don't really have a choice 
And I'll just quickly reference a piece of research that Senator Trevor came out with in the last couple of weeks. It's called Carbon Dated. And we looked at, pretty extensively at the supply chains, the suppliers of global MNCs. Now, global MNCs we know, uh, including Senator Trevor Bank, and many of you are, are uh, have committed to net zero transitions. 70 for five, 75% of the emissions of those global MNCs are coming from their supply chain, disproportionately in developing countries. Uh, yeah, these people that we surveyed have said, you know, we, are, we have already begun to discriminate against people that don't have good transition plans. We're not going to buy stuff uh, from people who themselves aren't on a trans transition pathway because if we continue to, we can't hit our own transition plan. So it's not a matter of whether the sovereign in, in, a, in a local developing economy is pushing their, their companies to transition to net zero. It's about whether their customers are pushing them and of course, whether their financiers are pushing them. And in each of those cases, they are slash we are. Uh, and, uh, but it's not just saying you do it or you die. It's saying, let us, let us help you. So we have a leading structure finance capability. We have a leading project finance capability across our markets. We're the world leader in blended finance. So many of these, these transition programs will involve money from, from multilaterals or for export credit agencies, uh, local governments. Uh, and, uh, and this is our expertise is, is packaging these things together. Uh, many of these, these projects, will be uh, viable on the margin because they incorporate uh, some, some form of carbon offset, carbon credits. Uh, and I'm chairing a task force, so it's 400 companies, or 250 companies, 400 people, uh, to, to create a really big, robust, viable, credible, credible, <clears throat> legitimate carbon offset market. It's, it's nice today, but it's not, it's not big and it's not credible. Uh, if, we, if we get that right, it's a, it's a further source of income. It's also a, a mechanism to get real dollars into the hands of the people in our market. So yeah, yeah the risk is there, yes. Uh, I do think that as a planet, we can avoid this more than one and a half degree increase in temperatures, which will avoid the, the worst of the risk for our markets. Uh, and we can we can actually generate some decent return for our shareholders and the planet a lot quickly uh, if we if we do, if we play the part that we can very naturally play given our, our capabilities. Okay, brilliant. Um, we're starting to get some questions coming in. Um, a question around sort of uh, your digital strategy and, and explicitly for for retail. Um, what the implications are of those investments on cost to serve customers, and, and does it mean that in some of those regions which you struggle to make adequate returns, that yeah. that hurdle should become uh, easier in the future? That's right, and and it's uh, it's already making a huge difference. I mean, we, <clears throat> we had as we called out with the, the the four markets that we called out uh, you know, two and a bit years ago uh, that were most in need of remediation. We, we called out Indonesia, uh, Korea, uh, the UAE, and India. Uh, the, the challenge was overwhelming on the retail side, and in each case, because we were, to varying degrees, subscale in, in the market, but with a with a like a fully scaled fixed cost base, and uh, each of those markets has returned to profitability. Indonesia is different; we, we we sold the, the bulk of that business in the form of Permata, uh, but each of those businesses has returned to profitability. As has China, uh, which wasn't in our our troubled country list, but the but the, the momentum in China has just been fantastic on the retail side. Why? Uh, part of it is a shift from uh, from you know conventional mass market banking products to affluent and wealth. That's that's helped in each of those cases. Uh, but much more importantly is the the cost improvement that's come from from digitization. So uh, we we rolled out I mean, almost three years ago now uh, a, a set of digital facilities in, in India that allowed us to onboard a customer in typically under seven minutes, uh, no human contact, end to end. Cost of acquisition went from something like hundred dollars per account. Uh, to something like an initially $17 account, now down to $7 an account. And the, what, what we're finding is that the average balance that comes in uh, on, on these digitally initiated accounts is actually higher than the average balance on, on the, the, the accounts that had been historically open through branches or through third-party sales agents. Or, uh, so lower cost of acquisition, much lower cost to serve. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, the entire service menu now for all of our core uh, digital banking offerings, uh, mobile banking or whatever, uh, uh, the marginal cost is close to zero, uh, and virtually every service is, is able to be uh, obtained on the mobile phone. Uh, that has also led to a dramatic increase in, in, uh, in net promoter score. So you know, the customers are saying, yeah, you really are much easier to deal with, and we really do like you much more, not just on, a, on an absolute basis, but on a relative basis. The, uh, we, we've now rolled out nine uh, digital banks in Africa. They're, 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 each is now well established, so I, the most recent was a year ago. The, uh, we, we continue to add accounts almost exclusively uh, through the digital channel. 
uh, the, the percentage of, of new clients that have visited a branch is, is under 2%, uh, and that will, that will approach zero. <clears throat> That's allowing us to, to reduce the branch footprint uh, and to uh, also to, to transform the branches that we do have and the ones that we retain uh, into much more advice and, and uh, well-being centers, uh, which obviously is, is positioning us to, to capture that more affluent population and then and to service the existing affluent population better. So uh, everything is going in the right direction and is and is visible on, on the bottom line in terms of the improvement of profitability of that business. Now that I, that I would say was masked to some degree last year because we had we took a very large provision in the midst of COVID. And uh, yeah, that's the bad news. It's not surprising news, but it's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that that we are still, we took a, a material management overlay against the retail portfolios, in particular in places like India. And, um, and while it's too early to say that, 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 those, that they were over provided, and we, we wouldn't say that, and we haven't said that, uh, the indicators are actually pretty good in terms of, of the actual loss rates coming through relative to what we feared could be the case. Uh, as we got into the early stages of the pandemic, so uh, normalized for the for for the uh, the uh, loan impairments, uh, and the, that that business is is really going from strength to strength, and is, is a substantial you know through cost of capital returner. Uh, but then you know, that that's obviously isn't the beginning of the end of our of our digital ventures. Uh, take a market like Indonesia, where we're absolutely subscale, and we've got a nice little wealth management business, uh, very small uh, mass market business. And um, we said, okay, we, we, could, we could build that out uh, the way we have for some of our other retail businesses, but that's you know, going against entrenched competition with, you know, with a disadvantage in terms of number of branches and, and uh, a relatively high cost of acquisition. And so let's take a different approach. And the approach that we've taken is to, in, in the first instance, uh, partner with the, the largest e-commerce platform in Indonesia, Bukalapak. Uh, they've got over 100 million customers growing super fast. Uh, and we built a technology platform, which is now live. It's, uh, we're now dealing with, with customers. Uh, it's still in the, in, the, in the test phase, but, but it's, it's live. And we're delivering a, a, you know, a full range of banking products through the Bukalapa platform uh, with, I would say, perfect customer convenience. So a customer knows that they're dealing with Standard Chartered Bank, but it's as if they're just dealing with, with Bukalapa on that platform seamlessly. It's, it's a major technical investment. Uh, we think it's unique in the world uh, in terms of its scale. We're obviously starting with, uh, with, with basic deposit uh, savings and, and payment products. We'll be adding credit products and then cards and then wealth uh, through time. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the opportunities to, to, in some ways, replicate, obviously very different environment, but replicate what, what people like Ant Financial have done in China, but in the, in, the, in the perfectly regulated market in Indonesia. By perfectly regulated, I mean, these assets and liabilities are going on to standard charter banks balance sheet. Uh, we are regulated. So we, we're, we have all the approvals that we need. Uh, there's no question that the regulator is going to come in afterwards and say, no, you're not actually allowed to do that, uh, as obviously is, is, is happening to some degree uh, in China. Uh, so, but, but, but the, the model is, is evidentially powerful. Uh, customers want the convenience of being able to deal with the, the full range of their transaction lives on a single platform. That, that's, what we're, that's what we're delivering. Early indications are very good. But it's, I mean, it is worth the earliest possible stage in terms of number of test clients that we've got right now. Technology is working. You know, the, the idea is it resonates. Um, but, but we've got other ventures as well. We, we built a couple of, of well, one in particular, standalone digital bank, which is Mox in Hong Kong. Uh, we did that in partnership with Hong Kong Tel and Trip.com. Uh, we and we built it. We are co-owning it and now co-managing it with uh, with our other partners. We're, we're controlling it. Um, it's been a huge success. Uh, you know, we've we've we're uh, we've got you know, three and a half percent of the population of Hong Kong has signed up. The uh, 80, 85 percent are active on the platform. Uh, we're the first of the virtual banks in Hong Kong to offer a credit card. The credit card, by the way, is the same as the debit card, so it's it, it's the same numberless card, uh, and you get to choose whether a transaction is credit or debit. Uh, it's um, uh, customer satisfaction is super high. The App Store ratings are still 4.8, 4.9. Uh, we haven't marketed until the last month. Uh, the last month we've been marketing, so we've had an acceleration in uh, in customer acquisition. This is very exciting, and uh, it'll be a little while before we get to to uh, to break even and beyond. Uh, it clearly need in a zero rate environment. We need to ramp up the, the credit products, and then we need to introduce wealth. And and frankly, we need mobility to come back because a big source of income is always going to be these FX and associated things, FX and insurance coming from people's travel, which is you know, approximately zero in Hong Kong right now, but that will change. We, we all know that. So I feel very good about that. 
Uh, so good, in fact, that we're going to take that, that tech stack and, and put it into our digital bank in Singapore. Uh, regulatory approval, uh, assuming that we get the regulatory approvals, every indication that we will. Uh, the, uh, we have not announced uh, our partner in Singapore, but it's at, uh, as impressive as, as Hong Kong Tel and, and Trip.com, in our opinion. Uh, so, so you know, feeling good about the opportunities there. Very different market, uh, so it's, it'll be a different proposition, but off the same basic tech stack. And we're doing other things. And we, we uh, in fact, just got the approvals this week uh, in Korea to, you know, there's, a, there's a bank that we've been co-developing with TOS, which is the ubiquitous payments platform in Korea. Uh, they they control, TOS controls us, we're a minority investor, uh, but we've been building, uh, we've been involved in the building all the way through. Uh, yeah, it's, it's got its final permissions now, that, that launches now in a standalone digital bank, but obviously leveraging that payments platform. In Taiwan, uh, we've gone live with, uh, with a, a similar standalone digital bank with, with Line, uh, so sort of the ubiquitous messaging platform. So these are all very exciting. Uh, I, you, you could say that any one of them is an experiment, uh, uh, but they're clearly different ways to skin the same cat, which is to deal with, to, to get access to the, some of the fastest growing markets in the world with good returns while addressing our scale advantage, either by saying, yeah, we'll take a smaller stake in somebody else's large scale platform, or uh, at the case with Hong Kong, uh, we'll create a disruptor ourselves uh, that, that can, uh, can be a challenger to the people that have a larger mass market uh, exposure today. Okay, thanks. Certainly uh, a lot of initiatives going on. Um, I had another question uh, back on costs, and I think for time this might need to be the last question. So back on costs and specifically on pay and performance rated pay, given quite a few banks around Q1 and, and subsequently during conferences have, have talked about some uh, pressures there uh, and, and whether you see this as, as a risk. I guess, you know, do you see this as a, as a transitory uh, issue given the sort of pace of recovery coming through or, or could this be a sustained um, uh, pressure on your cost line? Well, I, I think there's a few, uh, a, few, a few ways to look at this. We, we indicated in Q1 that if, if performance uh, it remained very, very strong, then obviously we'll have, a, have an uptick in, in performance related pay. Uh, and that could be a thing that would, that would cause us to, uh, to grow our, our expenses a little bit faster than would otherwise have been the case. I don't think that's any surprise to anybody. Uh, I will also say that our, our uh, pay to, uh, to profit ratios starts relatively low and we're relatively insensitive, not non-sensitive, but relatively insensitive, just given the nature of our business. So we're not, uh, the bulk of our business is not invest in banking, where the, where the, the, the linkage is much stronger. Um, so that's number one. Number two is uh, there, there clearly is a stepping up in, uh, in, the, in the competition for talent. So uh, a couple of our big competitors have, have made sort of grand pronouncements about adding thousands of people in Hong Kong and Singapore to focus on wealth and, and things like that. You know, I think it's, it's great. Uh, as I said, we, we welcome those to the party. We've been in that, in that party for five years now, and, uh, and we're, we're very happy to continue to compete uh, with people. And we're, we're, we are able to attract uh, very strong talent, uh, attract and retain very strong talent on the wealth management side because we've got a really good offer. And you know, at the end of the day, if, if, if you're a relationship manager, uh, you do the math. It's uh, well, how much can I sell from that platform and how much will they pay me for those sales? And, and, and you really have to have both. Uh, we do very well on the on the first point. So the, our, our platform, it's, it's a desirable platform for uh, for RMs to come and deliver off of because we've got a, a very broad uh, range of services. We've evidenced investment and we've got this top customer satisfaction rating in most of our markets. The uh, How much do I get paid for it? Well, we, we're going to pay what everybody else does. Uh, a little bit more sometimes, a little bit less others, but we're always going to be competitive. And uh, if that if that goes up, uh, then our costs are going to go up. And we'll we'll fund it elsewhere, right? And that, that's we made a commitment to uh, to keep our expense growth to below in, uh, to below inflation, and that's that's what we intend to do. And we have levers that we can pull. I mean, if, if the competitive pressure drives up our wages in one part of our business, uh, which has not been the case yet, uh, just for the record. Uh, but if it does, then uh, to the point where where we need to to address it, we will. We'll always defend our our core strength. Uh, but uh, uh, thankfully, we don't always have to do that with money. Uh, we can do that with with the offering uh, that we have for these these colleagues in the first place. Brilliant. I think we're, we've run out of time now for uh, today's main room presentation. So I'd just like to say thank you very much, Bill, for some really interesting comments there today, uh, and to the rest of the Standard Chartered team uh, for joining us at the exam BNP CEO conference. Uh, as a reminder, the, the next fireside chats will be with Viola and Adeco. 
Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and any other meetings you're attending. Uh, so thank you for listening and thank you very much again, uh, Bill and, and the team for joining us. Thanks. Thank you, Gary.